You are listening to a broadcast of the First Congregational United Church of Christ Phoenix. All right, Uh, let us worship God. And if you would all please join me in the unison centering prayer, it's listed in your bulletin. Let us recall that in our midst dwells God's begotten Son. As members of God's body joined, we are a God made one. and join me in the invitation to worship. God has made this day. Let us rejoice and be glad. The God who raised Jesus from the dead raises us to new life daily. Thanks be to God. Glory be to God, our Creator, to Jesus, our risen Christ, and to the Spirit, our Comfort. And now our opening hymn is number 43, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Please stand.
be seated. We come now to God confessing our brokenness and our openness to the forgiving love of God. We are painfully aware that our love falters from day to day and our faithfulness waxes and wanes. But God's love is steadfast and sure and God's faithfulness endures from age to age. Let us come before our loving creator with open and truthful hearts. Gracious God, you encourage us with your love, bringing new life out of death. We confess that we need your life-giving power in our lives and our relationships. We have hurt others and been hurt by them. We are often angry or afraid. We are not sure when to assert our needs and when to care for others' needs. We continue to live in ways that do not lead to peace and justice. Forgive us, O oh God. Pour your spirit of wisdom and healing upon us, that by our living and our loving, we may glorify you through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue in confession as we take these moments for our own personal reflections and confessions. The psalmist assures us, the Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. God upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Sisters and brothers, believe the good news that comes from God. We are loved. We are healed of our sins. We are forgiven. As forgiven people, let us share the peace of Christ with our neighbors. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with
reading this morning is from Revelations, chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. All he, also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This sounds like reading. Thank you, Sue. Sue and I had a wonderful online dialogue about that passage. <laughs> and uh, I frankly found it very revealing. <laughs> so, thank you. It's hard to break down a passage like that for children. The passage that I'm going to read to you from the Gospel is not at all difficult to read, except for the print on my uh, message Bible. I want to read the message version of this passage, and uh, it's very small print. <laughs> so bear with me here. This is a, a teaching of Jesus as he is about to uh, leave his disciples. It's towards the end of his earthly life, and he wants to teach uh, his disciples about things that he wants them to remember, even as he knew that his time with them was growing short. So, uh, it references the, the verse before it in which Judas Iscariot is about to betray Jesus, and so he leaves the, the group of 12, and uh, so that's the reference at the beginning. When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is seen for who he is, and God seen for who he is in him. The moment God is seen in Jesus, God's glory will be on display. In glorifying him, he himself is glorified. Glory all around. Children, I am with you for only a short time longer. You are going to look high and low for me. But just as I told the Jews, I'm telling you, where I go, you are not able to come. Let me give you a new command. Love one another. In the same way I loved you, you love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A 
Again, I want to encourage uh, those of you who have been visiting in our midst for a while, and obviously if you've come back, you found something here that you find to be compelling and drawing you into the Spirit of God. And if you are, I would encourage you next Sunday to stay after church for uh, a time for new members class and also on the 19th, two weeks after that. This is a good opportunity for you to follow God and to serve God here in this place and in this time. This has been a difficult week for some of us. Um, We have experience the passing of Barry McPherson who has gone on to be with God and uh, it's been a difficult time for Bill and for Susan and for those who truly loved him and knew him as a special person so we need to be in prayer for that family And we are in prayer for the family of John Bartlett, uh, Margot, and Becky are strong parts of our congregation, and we need to pray for that family as well. So would you join me, please, as we pray for them and for others who may be on your heart. Holy One of God, you have taught us the way of life and death and life beyond death. We thank you that you bring us together as a community of faith to share our burdens with one another, to to celebrate with each other, to, to love each other as you have loved us. We pray that you would bless those who are going through difficult passages in their lives, who need an extra portion of your grace. There are those that we have named. There are those who we have not named. And we would pause in these moments to lift them up to you by name. For all of these, O Lord, and for many others who we walk with daily, who need your strength and your guidance, we offer these prayers knowing that you answer all of our prayers. Give us the courage and the, and the peace to accept whatever answer you provide for us. For we know that you are a God of love, a God of grace. And confident of that grace, we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The passage I read to you from John's Gospel, I have read many, many times before, and I'm sure it's familiar to many of you. In fact, I have read it so many times that I tend to gloss over the power of Jesus' word. I have read it so many times that I have tended not to see the power in these words. I have read them so many times that I don't even see the words anymore, thinking, I know what it says. Let's move on to something else that I don't know. And that is my loss. This gospel writer, John, whose gospel is a totally different genre from the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John sets us up in such subtle ways that we don't know that we are being set up. You see, whereas the other three Gospels strive for historical accuracy, 
in retelling Jesus' life, John is more interested in converting the listener to an understanding of who Jesus is and what he would claim upon our lives. The guy is trying to get you to believe in Jesus. In fact, he's not doing this as a secret agenda. He tells us so toward the end of his gospel, in which he openly tells us, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. So he's really upfront about telling you that he wants you to not only read these words, but believe in the one about whom these words are spoken. The reason I tell you this is to forewarn you that when you read John's account, he is trying to seduce you into faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And so this wily writer places an event after another event, not necessarily because they happened in that order, but because he wants you to come to some conclusions about Jesus. And chapter 13 is a good example. You see, John begins this chapter by telling of an event so dramatic and so compelling that it is quite surprising that it's not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that is the washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus. Jesus demonstrates in this act what it means to have a humble servant love for another. And just so his disciples don't miss the point of why he's doing this, he tells them what he has done and why. John then contrasts this loving act by immediately telling these close and intimate friends that these men to whom he has demonstrated in this act of love just who he is, and then he says that one of them is going to betray him. The incident evokes a kind of whimsical humor. Jesus telling them that one of you is going to betray me. And they respond by fighting amongst themselves about who it may be and then denying that it's any one of them. They show more concern about their own guilt or possible guilt or the lack thereof than the consequences of what will happen when one of them betrays him. Peter, of course, has the loudest voice and protests the loudest, professing his willingness to go to the gallows for Jesus. Of course, Jesus knows better and tells him that he will deny Jesus three times before daybreak. And the incident ends with Judas meeting with the Jewish authorities to betray him. Can you see the irony of it all? The, the, the fact that he, he shows his love to them, rather than being concerned about Jesus, they're more concerned about their own skin, and then the betrayal. Jesus' love is contrasted by their broken spirit. It's only when you're conscious of this thread that weaves through this chapter that you can appreciate fully uh, Jesus' culminating teaching in this chapter, and it's what I read to you this morning. 
I began by telling you that I have tended in rereading this teaching to gloss over its depth. And I have. And it was only when I read it one more time that it finally sunk in what Jesus was trying to tell us. Notice how Jesus puts it. He says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Okay, you may ask, what's so new about this? Jesus has taught about love throughout his ministry. Over and over, Jesus tells us that, you know, this is the most important commandment. And he quotes the great Shema of, of the Hebrew people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what's, what's so new about this passage? I have looked upon this commandment solely as an encouragement to love, that I have missed the six most important words in this commandment. He says, just as I have loved you. Now, it's so subtle that we lose the radical nature of it all. The love commandment with which we are so f familiar exhorts us, love God and Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I don't think Jesus would deny that, you know, you should love yourself. But he takes it another step further. From love your neighbor as yourself to just as I have loved you, love one another. When I love my neighbor as myself, I use how I want to be treated as a measure of how I should love others. In fact, that's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is a pretty good rule of thumb. But Jesus wants to go further. Let me give you a very trivial example. Over the course of my marriage, I have learned some hard lessons about how to love my wife. <laughs> One of those lessons occurs when either of us gets sick. I don't mean major illness here. I mean uh, upset stomach or cold and a fever and the like. When I get sick, I just want you to leave me alone. <laughs> just leave me to my misery. I want to climb into bed, take my medicine, and hibernate until I feel better. That's how I want you to love me. Not so with Jane. <laughs> no, sir. When she gets the bug, she wants to be pampered. She wants me to come in occasionally and offer encouraging words, ask if she needs anything, plump up her pillow, give her a back rub and other signs of my endearing love. <laughs> Early on in our marriage, I wanted to love her the way I wanted to be loved. Leave me alone. Boy, did I learn quickly that that didn't work. <laughs> if I were to love her using myself as the measuring rod, it would not demonstrate to her my love. And I found out quickly from her, and she would say, you really don't love me, do you? You know, you, you don't care that I'm in misery. <laughs> so using the self as a criterion about how to love others does not always work. 
So Jesus offers us another more excellent way, as the Apostle Paul puts it. He teaches us that we should follow Jesus' example of love as the way for our love. As I look at the life of Jesus, I see him setting up the building blocks for loving, demonstrating over and over how we should love each other. His life serves as the model, the paradigm for how we are to love. I just want to share a couple of practical things that I see in Jesus' life that models for us what love is. The first thing I see Jesus over and over again doing in his ministry and in his relationships is to listen completely. The art of listening, I must admit, is not one that comes naturally to us. That great Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh calls it deep listening. But if you are like me, we tend to plan what we are going to say in response while the other person is speaking to us. Do you find yourself doing that? That happens a lot in arguments, right? When we joust verbally with one another, we're often lining up our arguments while the other is laying out his or hers. This is especially true when we are conversing about deeply felt issues. You put a pro-life person and a pro-choice person together talking about abortion, and you learn soon what I am talking about. Jesus, in contrast, will get to the heart of the matter both against enemy and friend alike, simply by listening beyond the words. Take his encounter with Nicodemus, for example. Here is one of the leaders of the Pharisees, the, the group that sets themselves up as the enemies of Jesus. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night Jesus knew who he was. He was a fairly prominent person. He could have easily dismissed out of hand Nicodemus as one of those people. He could have judged him as an adversary and treated him that way. Instead, he listens and knows that Nicodemus has some deeply troubling spiritual issues. He listens for the words behind the words and eventually gets to the heart of what Nicodemus is there for. To love as Jesus loves is to be willing to empty yourself of your own agenda and hear the other person beyond the words that are spoken. To love in this way moves us deeper into our relationship and closer to the hope that Jesus had for the community of those who followed him. A second way that I see Jesus loving is one that is found in the words of uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, whose book, uh, Greg reminded me of the other day when we were having lunch. Uh, in this book, Ruiz speaks of four agreements, four uh, criteria for, for how he will conduct himself with others. And the first of the, these agreements is to be impeccable with your words. Be impeccable with your words. And that's Jesus. Our Lord always used his words to increase the presence of love in the world. As James observes, the tongue is a mighty weapon. 
that is often used to destroy and to tear down others. If we are honest, we will confess that we are vulnerable to that way of using words as weapons. It is not about the truth, but why we say what we say. Even when he spoke a hard word, Jesus didn't do so to hurt, but to build up the other. To love as Jesus loves is to follow that example. We could go on with many ways in which Jesus would use himself as an example. To move beyond the old way. To love not as we love ourselves, but to love as Jesus did. We'll never do it perfectly, none of us. But his love models for us what we should strive to be. Learn of him and you will find true love. Amen. This hymn that we will sing, I think may be new to you and it... uh, But it is a pretty and simple melody, and I would ask uh, Randall to play it through once, and then we will... Is that what we're supposed to do? (laughs) Thank you. Uh, It's called Where Charity and Love Prevail. It's number 396. If you are able, would you please stand? ushers could come forward. I think what we could say today is, as this church, this place has loved you, perhaps you could learn to love it the same. And now is an opportunity to show one expression of your love. Oh, no, no, no. 
most holy and loving God, whose generosity in love is known in all our lives, whose grace abounds in so many different ways, we give you thanks for all the ways in which you have touched our lives. And we know that you have given all in love. So may we learn to love one another and to love you just as you have loved us. In the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is found in your bulletins, the words, We Are Called. to love one another just as Jesus loved each and every one of us and has revealed that love to each one of us in so many different ways. You are instruments of that love. 
go forth into the world to love that world in all the ways that Jesus has called you. And as you do, peace will reign in your life and in our world. And now following this, we invite those of you who would like to share in communion. These elements have been blessed and are ready to be celebrated with each of you. And so as Gloria stands here, you may come forward to receive it if you so desire. Go with God. been listening to worship at First Congregational United Church of Christ, where God still speaks in a language we can all understand, the language of overwhelming joy and extravagant welcome, a place where the words are for everybody to hear, a place where all are welcomed into the heart of God, a place where God's loving voice always says, you are my child, I love you. We'd love to have you visit us in person each Sunday at 1030 a.m., We're located at 1407 North 2nd Street in Phoenix, Arizona. If you missed any portion of this broadcast and Fort Pass services, please visit us on the web at phoenixucc.org. And be sure to join us next week right here.